welcome everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed our our hold music and welcome slide. Thanks to the uh, magic of Deja Brock, who runs that for us every week now. Um, so thank you, Deja. And um, I'm Will Fenton. I'm the director of research and public programs at the Library Company of Philadelphia. I suspect you have heard of us, but if you haven't, we are a research library that was originally founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1731. Today we have uh, program area specializations in all things early Americana, visual culture, print culture, uh, political economy and business history, uh, and certainly African American history. Um, uh, this particular series, our fireside chat series, I started right around the beginning of the pandemic and it's been sustained by the generosity of our research fellows. Um, the library company is very proud of our fellows and uh, we're very grateful uh, for their generosity in sharing not only completed books that we're all really excited about, not only because they feature our collections, but because we're just really invested in our scholars, but also works in progress, like the one that you're going to hear today. Um, this is a little different than some of the web, uh, the, the Zooms you might've been on. Uh, your camera is not enabled and that is by design. It's seven o'clock on a Thursday night for our speaker, it's actually one in the morning in Paris. Uh, so it is late enough. You don't need to be on camera unless you have to be on camera. So we encourage you to participate as some of you already have through the chat functionality. But particularly if you have any questions, I ask that you use the Q&A because I have lousy eyes. And um, if you put them in the chat, I might overlook them, but there will be an opportunity for us to bring some questions uh, to our presenter today and I'll do my best to work through them sequentially. So as soon as you have a question, just drop it in the Q&A. And then of course, if you happen to miss any of this or you wanna share this with anyone that might be um, uh, excited about this particular topic, we will follow up via email with a recording of this, as well as some lovely session notes that will help you continue learning if you're interested in this topic. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Agnes Trouillet uh, who is an Associate Professor of British Studies at the University Paris Nanterre. Her research focuses on contemporary and colonial political history, more specifically on Pennsylvania, with which she has had a special relationship after having taught four years at the University of Penn. She is interested in the issue of division as generative power, and her current project examines the role of William Penn's settlement design in reshaping space and sovereignty in the Delaware Valley. She has a forthcoming article on the boundary dispute between Pennsylvania and Maryland in a volume from the American Philosophical Society Conference, The Power of Maps and the Politics of Borders. And she is of course currently a library company fellow. We're delighted to have you, Agnes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Will. Um, I wanted to thank you and, and the library company for allowing me to talk tonight uh, at this fireside chat event. And um, I wanted to thank uh, warmly the, the library company for granting me this fellowship um, and being able to use the fantastic collections um, of the library company and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Um, I wanted to thank you will particularly for organizing these wonderful events and uh, all the staff and uh, James Green who has helped me in my research and uh, the curatorians uh, for uh, helping me navigate the collections and for their precious helps in also um, um, helping me find uh, documents and sources for tonight and Deja for advertising such a nice, uh, <laughs> with such a nice uh, presentation. Um, so I will do my best to share my findings tonight and um, thank you for reminding it's a, that it's a work in progress. Um, and um, my project is actually threefold. I study well, the competing uh, interpretations of, of space and territory between the European settlers and, and, and the native populations. Um, I also study uh, boundaries as um, my um, well previous work for the article entailed. And uh, the other aspect is the, the surveying itself of, of, of these lines and how this um, redefined uh, the, the, 
the landscape and the, and the territory in that Delaware Valley. Um, so um, tonight I will show um, how um, this surveying was done and I was in focus mostly on Thomas Holm who was the first surveyor general of Pennsylvania. Um, and doing this research also using digital collections uh, sort of um, sent me to different tracks, which is also the, well, the point of research, right? And um, I will tonight focus more on the origins and what, um, uh, what led through um, this, this specific uh, surveying uh, practices and um, more than how Pennsylvania was surveyed uh, in detail. I won't go that much into the years uh, 1682 and following, but mostly before. So, um, and um, when William Penn was granted his charter, uh, um, the, the important thing to, 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 to remind is that um, it was not a, the Delaware Valley was not a white canvas as much as uh, William Penn wanted to, to, to adv advertise it uh, and did in a very famous map from 1681 that uh, showed very sparsely settled um, uh, tracts of land, very few uh, and scattered uh, native populations. Um, but um, a map that actually showed very familiar tree species that would be uh, attractive to, to the English uh, potential settlers. Um, what I want to insist on is that, well, this region was already very dynamic with exchanges between the uh, native populations, the Delaware Indians, the Lenny Lenape, and um, the what were who were called the, the early settlers, the Swedes and, and Finns and Dutch and English that uh, came previously to um, to Penn. I realize I haven't started sharing my screen yet, which I will do. Um, So this is where I was supposed to start. So I'm starting now. Uh, so um, on March uh, 4th, uh, 1681, William Penn was granted his charter for, for Pennsylvania by King Charles II. Uh, so Penn would not arrive in Pennsylvania until uh, October 1682. And he left his cousin, William Markham, uh, who he had made deputy governor of the province to deal with his land affairs in the interim. Uh, notably settling the boundary dispute with Lord Baltimore, the proprietor of the neighboring colony of Maryland over the situation of the 40th parallel of latitude, which determined Penn's province crucial outlet to the ocean. To assist Markham, uh, Penn had appointed four commissioners for the settling of the province, uh, later called the commissioners of property. One of them was uh, another of his cousins, William Crispin, who unfortunately died during the crossing of the Atlantic. And this is how Thomas Holm became first surveyor general of Pennsylvania. Holm landed in Pennsylvania in June 1682 with his four children, a widower and 58 years old, an age when most men were preparing to retire at, at the time. Although by more than 20 years younger, uh, William Penn had known Holm for a dozen years. They had met in Ireland's uh, active centers of Quakerism, uh, Holm being actually one of the founders of the movement in that country. Um, I won't uh, detail uh, his uh, religious activism, but he notably authored a pamphlet on Quaker's sufferings, having himself and his wife uh, suffered numerous uh, persecutions and imprisonment. imprisonment. Uh, besides, Holm was a member um, of the Free Society of Traders, the joint stock company launched by Penn in April 1681, 
mostly composed of English Quaker merchants who had agreed to invest capital in the colony in exchange for special privileges. Yet Holm was also among the society's committee of 12 men who had committed to emigrate permanently to Pennsylvania. Thus Holm was charged with the daunting task of surveying the new province and also as part of Crispin's appointment to work as commissioner of property. The question thus is how Holm, who was neither an engineer nor a surveyor nor a cartographer, would be able not only to survey the city of Philadelphia, but the whole province of Pennsylvania, executing it with the most remarkable skills, efficiency, and velocity, but also to produce the beautiful corresponding maps. Here, the 1683 a portrait here of the city of Philadelphia. And um, uh, here, the map of uh, the improved part of Pennsylvania and America, divided into counties, townships, and lots. This is uh, the um, um, the source that is 1690, um, that is in the collections of the library company. Um, the, 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 the map was um, um, finished in 1687, actually. Uh, the 1690 uh, version actually has um, addition to, its, uh, to it. Thomas Holm grew up in Lancashire in a yeoman family of self-sufficient, ambitious men. He was 17 years old when the first civil war uh, between the royalists and parliamentarians broke out. Um, he chose the latter and most likely enrolled in Cromwell's new model army that was sent to Ireland to crush the Catholic rebellion. Many soldiers and officers in this army held dissenting or radical views which fueled their fanatical zeal against the Irish Catholics who had massacred Ulster Protestant planters in 1641 in an attempt to regain their sovereignty. Cromwell's men landed in Ireland in September 1649, and by 1653, they had crushed Catholic, Royalist, and Covenanter opposition. The population suffered from famine and plague, uh, yet the soldiers were not faring much better. They were resentful of long overdue pay, and in lieu of cash, it was decided to compensate them with the lands uh, forfeited uh, to English Protestants by um, the Catholics, and all literate Irish, uh, Irish landholders with a yearly income of 10 or more pounds would be forced to go to exile or to relocate in poorer regions, hence the phrase to hell or to Connaught. Yet the settlement of Cromwell soldiers involved a comprehensive survey of the bounds and resources to be distributed, involving large numbers of surveyors. In 1653, two surveys were commanded. For the first, known as the Civil Survey, local commissioners were to cover each parish and townland uh, townland is the smallest land subdivision in Ireland, uh, taking depositions from landholders about the extent and boundaries and qualities of the lands. Holm had gathered a strong knowledge of the land uh, through his soldiering years and was among the eight officers commissioned to conduct a civil survey of County Kerry in the Munster province, covering approximately 1.2 million acres. Uh, representing uh, approximately 1,800 uh, square miles. The commissioners were um, notably to see that any Irish exempted from transplantation be not allowed to live scatteringly, but be gathered together into townships and villages for def defense. Plantation in Ireland had demonstrated that two sparsely populated settlements were problematic, not only in terms of defense, but also for the improvement of the land an experience that Penn would have in mind when designing his province. In the concessions he granted to the first purchasers, Penn insisted on closely knit settlement patterns, notably stating that 10 families at least should be settled on a 5,000 acre tract of land. And this number of 10 originates actually in medieval English governance systems that Penn would exactly transplant, as we will see. 
conducted between 1654 and 1656, the civil survey covered 27 of Ireland's 32 counties, yet insufficiently distinguished profitable from non-profitable lands, a necessary requirement for the redistribution of land. This is what prompted the Down Survey, a cartographic survey based on measurements in the field, actually the first ever detailed land survey conducted on a national scale. This required rigorous surveying and mapping, which seemed more and more unfeasible within reasonable time to survey your General Worsley, who estimated the work would take 13 years. This is when Dr. William Petty entered the stage, volunteering to complete the survey in 13 months. William Petty was the Surgeon General of the English Army. Brilliant and audacious, uh, Petty had also jockeyed himself to prominent positions in financial circles. In the process, he would become one of the biggest landowners of the island, uh, acquiring uh, 160,000 acres at the end of the 1660s. The Down Survey, which would eventually need 15 months, was nonetheless uh, exceptional in many respects. It produced a thoroughly detailed mapping of a large part of Ireland, the 22 counties allotted to the army, with written descriptions containing the number of inhabitants, their name, origin, and religion for each barony, which you can see on the uh, right-hand side um, uh, source. These were uh, provided in the terriers, which accompany maps and give a topographical description of the lands. Terrier, terriers had been used since the Middle Ages to register land ownership and contained the list of tenants and their tenures with the services and dues owed to the lord of the manor or baron. Or baron. This is an example um, of an earlier terrier from 1638. Um, uh, where you see uh, the description in terms of, of, of the units which made up uh, um, uh, the, the um, which made up the due, like uh, and which made up the the unit. Sorry, a farm, a house, uh, and an improvement. So, um, yet from the beginning of the 17th century. Terriers emphasized the acreage and annual economic value of the land rather than the services and dues owed to the Lord. And this is what we see um, here. And um, this evolution translated new survey practices in England as landowners started to have their properties evaluated. This prompted the emergence of a new profession of land surveyors employed to evaluate landowners' estates, um, i.e. the property survey. And the property survey would be the procedure used by Thomas Holm when surveying William Penn's province. Achieving such remarkably thorough maps and terriers uh, required accurate scientific measurement, which only specific instruments allowed. Highly sophisticated instruments would not be available until the second half of the 18th century, notably the Zenith telescope uh, that would finally allow, using celestial coordinates, to measure a degree of latitude. In 1767, it allowed English astronomer Charles Mason and surveyor Jeremiah Dixon to measure the 40th parallel of latitude with enough precision, finally ending the boundary dispute between the proprietor, uh, proprietor families of Pennsylvania and Maryland after eight decades. Here I put engraving just to um, help you imagine what a a survey could look like at the time. Um, well, however, the early 17th uh, century brought significant improvement in the art of surveying, notably with the discovery of logarithms. Geometry and trigonometry were introduced into the university curriculum, and teachers of mathematics were actually expected to, to teach surveying and take their students uh, to practice in nearby fields. The simple rod for linear measure, the magnetic compass, uh, the quadrant, 
the plain table for recording observations had been augmented or superseded by more accurate instruments. Uh, so here you see uh, a chain, the Gunter's chain, uh, which had been invented in the 1620s, which consisted of 100 links for a total of 60 feet of measurement, with brass rings at every 10 links, allowing partial measurements. It was stretched out along a path and secured to the ground with steel pins. The measurement was recorded and the process repeated until the surveyor reached the final end point. Well, the surveyors in the plural, as here we realized that this process could need several of them, particularly on hilly and unopened terrains. Uh, vertical navigation instruments such as the Astrolab and the Azimuth Compass now not only allowed to a certain directions and measure angles, but were also used for surveying heights. Um, you have the protractor on the right hand side, and here I included a, um, the picture of a quadrant that Sarah uh, very kindly uh, sent me that she took herself. Um, this is from a later period and from England, but it's interesting to see that um, you have all this material in a, in a case that was obviously transportable and what you see in the middle might have been a textbook or a field book for the surveyors. Um, a part of these instruments would unfortunately be either too fragile or cumbersome in the American colonies, um, but surveyors nonetheless would be able to rely on more accuracy. Two notable major improvements were the protractor and the circumferentor. Uh, the circumferentor is on your left side. Um, uh, the, so it's called also the surveyor's compass. And it's uh, this circular box housing a magnetic needle floating above a compass marking 360 degrees, which allowed to measure horizontal angles and was commonly used for establishing the corner boundaries of a parcel. The theodolite also allowed to measure horizontal angles. And according to the authoritative surveying manual by William Leyburn, large surveys could now be conducted using a circumferentor and a theodolite and small surveys with the plane table. The complete surveyor or the whole art of surveying land was published in 1653 and enjoyed four re-editions re until 1722. It was such a bestseller that George Washington himself, who famously surveyed Lord Fairfax property and the western frontier of Virginia, borrowed a copy and never returned it. Leyburn himself was a surveyor and notably surveyed London after the Great Fire of 1666. His treaties combine extremely detailed scientific aspects of mathematics and trigonometry with practical descriptions of all surveying instruments and their use. How to prepare a plain table, how to screw instruments onto the table or store them in different attached cases, how to secure sheets of paper for drawing to prevent their shifting. Leyburn advertised the metamorphosis of the plane table, which, if prepared properly, could be converted either into a circumferentor or into a theodolite. Uh, procedures were provided for drawing, coloring, and ornamenting maps. The manual even showed how to create a fill book um, with four columns for measuring degrees, minutes, the 60 uh, subdivisions of a degree uh, and record the numbers of the chains and links. It explained how to take and protract plots of fields, plains, woods, parks, forests, but also roads, streets, highways, courts, and alleys, uh, how to enclose lordship or common fields, even uh, how to survey inaccessible locations, notably uh, mountainous and uneven grounds, making the art of surveying indeed seem easy. Furthermore, Leyburn's manual presented legal issues linked to surveying. Here uh, you see the Nines book, uh, which was devoted entirely to legal aspects, where surveyors uh, could learn how to take the plot of a whole manor and find the quantity and content thereof and how to keep their account uh, in the field book. But um, also, um, the, um, uh, 
really legal aspects linked to, to the surveying of manners. And I'm particularly interested in manners because as part of his charter, Penn granted several manors to wealthy settlers. His own Pensbury Manor is well known, yet manors were not only a sign of wealth. There were also self-contained units of government inherited from the medieval English legal and political practices that Penn would transplant in this province. The Free Society of Traders would notably be granted 20,000 acres to erect a manor called Manor Frank. Um, along the same line, Penn transplanted all the English geographical, territorial, and administrative divisions that allowed various degrees of autonomy, borrowed the first recognizable modern aspect of local government in England, enjoy specific privileges such as exemptions from feudal dues, the right to hold a market and to levy certain taxes. The parliament that would become a de facto governing body from 13th century was structured around boroughs and counties. The liberty and the liberties you have around uh, um, uh, Philadelphia uh, was also a unit of local government administration in which regalian right was revoked and where the land was held by a lord. Areas covered by liberties could be widely scattered across the county or limited to a small area. Uh, the former, which was adopted for Philadelphia County, as a matter of fact. Finally, townships were also units of local governments and they would enjoy more autonomy through a special status in Pennsylvania as in New Jersey. And here I jump to um, later um, uh, slide so you can see well the township here uh, German and Haverford who were uh, wealthy well important first purchasers and um, the on the right side uh, what was granted to the society is just one example because there were many uh, um, more much more land granted to the society um, William Petty's project for the Dawn Survey was accepted in December, uh, December 1654, and he proceeded to work. Uh, the surveying enterprise entailed extraordinary challenge on the scientific but also practical level. He succeeded notably thanks to an extra pragmatical mind. And Petty was actually also the author of several economy treatises, and he had founded a new science called political arithmetics leading him to be considered as the founder of English political economy by Karl Marx himself. His methods were revolutionary, um, for example, providing uniform and ready for use field books prepared for all surveyors with sheets of papers uh, of paper by five or six feet square glued together and divided into 10 acres areas plotted to uniform scale while others were ruled with single acre sections. Uh, books were made containing the names of all the lands to be measured with the name of their old proprietors, um, indicating the bounds, important topographical features, um, and other in information of interest. But another exceptional innovation was his rational division of work. Um, as you can see here in the quote, uh, he had recruited admeasurers, uh, for example, among foot soldiers who were familiar with the ground, uh, protractors, uh, reduced bar barony plots, uh, so that the maps would be of uniform size for binding. And one group was composed of experts in surveying who checked all operations and totaled the line uh, linear surveys made by all the admeasurers. Um, the staff who had participated in the civil survey were enlisted, and this is when Holm gathered a momentous experience that would serve him uh, several years later. Um, Will, um, I don't know if I should stop here or if to, to leave question, time for, for questions and, and maybe comments. Um, it is totally up to you, Agnes. Uh, we have, you could take another 10 minutes if you wish, if you'd like to go through some of your other beautiful slides, or if you'd like to pause that, that's okay. Sure. So, <laughs> uh, 
I will go on to this next slide and and to 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 try to explain the thank you well to, to try to explain the the principle at the origins of the well the grid iron design actually uh, because to understand the specific grid iron design that would be used by Thomas Holm to structure the capital city of Philadelphia and that would also be used um, for the survey township more generally speaking that would apply to the whole of province of the province and later uh, to um, all the, the land west of the um, Ohio River from the 1785 land ordinance, it is important to uh, go back even a little further in time. Uh, actually, back to the Romans, who proceeded to large land confiscations to settle Roman citizens in conquered countries. Uh, and used exactly the same principle. The allotment of shares or lots was done by dividing the landscape in a regular fashion by rectilinear, parallel and equidistant axis, the limits or boundaries, whose intersection generated large quadrangular units, scamna or centuries. Land surveyors were called the agrimensores, meaning land measurers, or gromatici, the users of the groma, the optical square. Agri, meaning a field, understood as a workable, cultivable piece of land. Also referring to a land as a tract of land owned by someone, referring to a country as a specific tract of land in a country or region, or a territory as a tract of land occupied by a group of people. And the key to the system of organization and representation of space as implemented by the Romans, as by all agricultural societies, indeed lies in the shape and dimensions of the field. The centuries, the large units, actually corresponded to a space which contains a hundred times a fundamental unit, the urandium or uradium, which in the antiquity referred to the smallest share of land that would be transmitted to the children, quae ereduem sequerentur. Thus, the biggest division uh, unit adopted by the Romans to limit largest territories was conceived as the product of the multiplication of much modest uh, units proportional to the work of the plowman who plowed them. This explained the use of the quadrangular square or rectangular shape as the most appropriate system to divide and distribute land. By using the grid iron system to delineate properties such as envisioned by Penn for his capital city and his whole province, Holm um, thus superimposed the structure that profoundly and irre irremediably reshaped the space in the Delaware Valley. It was at complete odds with the conception of space and territory as expressed by the native populations with fluid and amorphous lines, essentially delineating hunting grounds and symbolizing the connections between the various nations, as much as a white canvas as Penn wished to fill, and which he had advertised um, back in 1681. Um, this is just um, the last slide I can show you tonight, um, because uh, this is the second promotion um, that Penn did uh, to attract um, purchasers uh, to, to, to settle in his province. It was actually sent to the um, Free Society of Traders, to their um, leaders, actually. As I mentioned earlier, the, the society was um, uh, launched as early as, as Penn got his charter and was compo composed of uh, wealthy uh, London Quaker, merchant, uh, Quaker merchants, mostly, who had accepted to invest in the, in the venture. And um, these men um, understandably wanted special privileges in exchange. And they actually, well, um, convinced Penn to, there were the people who actually convinced Penn to um, put so much power in the council 
and so little power in the assembly. The frame of government, the 1682 frame of government was actually um, imposed to Penn by these people who wanted to be sure they would be able to manage affairs in Pennsylvania. And this is the second um, advertisement and promotion, actually one of the best pieces of promotion made by Penn. Um, this was accompanied, as, as you see, with uh, the platform or the map of Philadelphia as uh, surveyed by Holm, which um, uh, contained uh, the, number, um, the numbers of the lots that had been attributed to the free society uh, people. And there was a key to uh, read the map and to identify where your property lay. These men um, were granted um, property lots in the city and actually, and I will finish uh, on that, um, you can only buy property lots in, in, in the city if you had acquired country lots. And uh, this was a way to grant privilege, uh, access, proximity and access um, to um, these wealthy people and make sure they would be close to the rivers and also to the, 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 the seats of, 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 of um, commerce, economy and, and politics in the province. So I will stop here and thank you very much for any comments or, or questions um, you will have. Thank you so much, Agnes. And um, thank you generously for sharing that work in progress. I feel like we're getting a, a sneak peek at something that's gonna be wonderful. And I encourage all of you to participate and to offer any suggestions you might have, because I suspect that as a current fellow, Agnes is always looking for additional suggestions for things she might integrate into her project. Um, I have a very naive question. Um, my understanding is that you have cities that are sort of gridiron design, some of which sort of get imposed a little bit later, like I'm thinking of New York. Southern New York is not such a grid, but as you get further north, certainly a grid. Uh, if memory serves, Savannah, which was also another relatively early city, but came after Philadelphia, um, also grid-based. My question to you, Agnes, is how unusual was this design, this plan that Holmes puts forward? Thank you very much, Will, for your question. Well, um, I will start by answering that as a European, um, the first time I went to New York, this is exactly what fascinated me, the green iron design. I have a very strong, uh, very poor sense of direction. And the design is really helpful. You can never get lost. <laughs> Except for when you get down to the village or the financial district, right? <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's very practical. Um, I have uh, uh, looked in, in Europe for... Um, models and actually found uh, the city of Le Havre uh, in on the northwest coast of France that would be used also um, and uh, but well it was it was um, also used mostly well I, the, the the main source of inspiration for for whom um, apparently would have been uh, uh, Christopher Wren's uh, plan for the rebuilding of the city of London after, after the, the destruction of the Great Fire. Um, I didn't take time to uh, show the, 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 the width of the, of the streets in Philadelphia, but um, roads and streets were uh, wide enough to prevent the spread of fire, for example. Uh, but this is uh, something um, that is corollary to the gridiron. Um, and um, I'm actually, well, uh, welcoming information on that myself. I know that uh, Thomas Penn, uh, after his father, uh, built the town of Carlisle exactly on the same model. And um, this would also be uh, reused um, in other parts of uh, Western Pennsylvania. 
uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. So actually, we have a question that sort of brings us into that period of Pennsylvania history. Um, Gus Whitmer asks, how did the infamous James Logan, his walking purchase, fit into the timeline? Yeah, thank you for this question. And I actually, uh, well, I don't remember if I went up to the uh, walking purchase in, in, in my introduction, I don't think so. But it is true that um, Penn profited from the rather harmonious relationship that the early settlers has, had developed with the Indians. And um, so things were pretty quiet for the first decades of settlement as far as Indian affairs went. Uh, and it is true that it is really from the walking purchase that uh, things started to go uh, awry and uh, an open war started with the Maryland uh, proprietor of uh, lands uh, along the Susquehanna River. Uh, James Logan, um, <laughs> I'm very interested in, in James Logan and I, I, I can't wait to, to, to be there in person to delve into his papers because um, there is so much, I guess, to, to find there. And um, uh, he was, he had, well, I, I didn't talk about the, uh, the number of offices that these people uh, accumulated, actually, and James Logan is a very good example. And he was in charge of land affairs, and he would um, actually supplement uh, the pens when in their absence. And so he, you could say he destroyed the, the, the um, the work of, of William Penn in a way and actually well at any rate he betrayed uh, his uh, well his expectations and um, and Penn's heirs as well in a way so mm -hmm. yeah yeah the the appeals to brother Onus uh, that would be William Penn uh, rang a little hollow after the walking purchase ho hoax um, so I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, we have a, a couple of questions here from Gerald Martin. The first is actually, they're both quite specific. Uh, can you speak about the 1690 map? Yeah, um, maybe I, I, I because I, I, I didn't show it really. So uh, this is- again, If you don't mind pulling it up. So, um, okay. Uh, this is a, a really beautiful map, and um, uh, very mm, mm. impressive in terms of draftsmanship, and and really, and there is also a colored uh, edition. And um, what you can uh, see is that, well, of course, you have uh, Pens uh, Philadelphia at the very uh, bottom in the middle. And uh, it is uh, reproduced in um, larger size at the top uh, in the middle of the map. And you can see the, the perfect, uh, well, grid iron design here. But you, could, you can see that um, uh, especially um, in Bucks here and in Philadelphia counties, you do have uh, very regular rectangular shapes as well. Uh, really um, regular tracts of land. But um, conversely, and this is another example I wanted to show here, you have uh, uh, Pasha's property or circled on the, on the bottom left side, with this, which is jutting into the Liberty Land uh, of Philadelphia City uh, in a triangular uh, fashion. And it's not really regular. And actually, Holm did his best to have rectangular shapes, uh, but he could not always, um, because it depended also on the, on the, on the, the tracts of land. And, uh, and it was not always possible to, uh, to create those uh, regular, these this regular uh, designs. Um, what is interesting uh, also um, is, uh, yeah, 
the, the manors. Here I wanted to uh, show you the manor of Moland on the left hand side because this is the manor that was granted to Nicholas Moore, who was part of the Free Society of Traders, who, were, who was actually his, his president and was very, very adamant to, to, to go to Pennsylvania. He left with 60 indentured servants. He was um, full of projects and did an amazing uh, promotion for the colony to, to, to Penn. And um, he was granted a huge uh, property, as you can see, because he invested so much money. And um, he actually died only five years uh, after uh, immigrating to Pennsylvania. But in the meantime, he had accumulated so many, uh, many offices as well, many political offices. And his manor was, uh, would become a bone of contention because uh, the, the society wanted to, to um, to get the property back, and this was uh, this went on trial, and it was a very well lively story of um, uh, of about property and, and these people. Actually, the society was short lived, uh, commercially speaking, because um, uh, these men would actually uh, rather develop their own commercial interests than the societies, as opposed to pens who, who really wanted the collective development of uh, at the scale of the province. And so individual interests uh, really um, took over. Uh, so commercially, the society was short-lived, but these men, thanks to the special privileges that Penn had granted them, were able to actually leverage enormous power uh, on the province. Just uh, briefly on, on, on that first map, there were a couple of, of tables to the left and to the right. Are those distances to other locations? Um, tell. Yeah, uh, you know what? It's, it's interesting you, you, you mentioned in this because I was actually um, trying to have a closer look at all these elements, which, okay, so here, is the names uh, you have? You had the names of the settlers, actually. So ah. the first map, uh, the, the 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 portraiture of Philadelphia had only numbers because it was done in one year, in just one year, and uh, Holm actually surveyed twelve thousand acres uh, in just one year. And yes, this is crazy. And he didn't have time to write the names on the map. And so he put numbers and that's why he provided the key to read the map to these people. But by 1687, he had the time to survey uh, the, well, all this rest of the province mm -hmm. and, um, and was able to, to put the names of the people. And this is actually one of my, uh, this something I wanted to say in the beginning, one of my very ambitious projects is to trace the, um, what this man will become in terms of land tenure and political tenure. And there is actually a map uh, dated from a century later, well, 1770, um, which, is very, very similar because there are no significant maps in the whole course of the century in between. And so the idea would be to compare the 1690 map with the 7070 map to see, uh, well, uh, the names, uh, to see uh, the type of property, the quantity of, of, of land that these people still had and if their descendants, if their heirs were still using uh, special privileges in terms of political, uh, well, influence as well. All right, I've, uh, I've got to be more cognizant of all these questions that are accruing. They all look wonderful. And unfortunately, I've been very uh, selfish in my own interest here. We have a question <laughs> here from Ivan Jurin. Um, how are the individual lots and squares marked? in Philadelphia? For example, corner pins, trees, rocks? Oh, how they were marked? Uh, I wouldn't be able to, to answer this question, I'm afraid, exactly. Um, 
uh, yeah, well, so um, I need to, well, there are um, tons of sources in the land office because this is where all the surveys and deeds, et cetera, have been uh, uh, collected. So uh, there is so much I need to uh, look at there. But also I was interested in how Holm himself did it. So I do have some elements um, uh, in the only book actually that uh, was devoted to Thomas Holm by Irma Kokoran in the 1990s, in 1993, I think. And she um, traced um, surveys and, and, and uh, well, um, by Holm himself, but I haven't had time to have, uh, well, really a deep look at, at this and I need to, to spend more time on that to, to see, well, uh, uh, comparing to what I presented on the civil and down survey and uh, if he used, what instruments he used, I, I, would, be, I would like to be able to retrace um, surveying expeditions by Holm and his deputy surveyors and, and, and crews and try to, to, to well, uh, revive one expedition and see how it went, well, the physicality of the surveying and uh, how it went on the terrain and who was part of the expedition and how, how they proceeded and what instrument they used and what field books, et cetera, et cetera. And so that might, when I'm done that, maybe I will be able to answer that question more. Um, <laughs> this is the, um, the adventure of a new research project. Um, yeah. And uh, speaking of which, we have um, a comment from Eric Michelson that might help us start to come to an answer about where that grid pattern comes from. He writes, I'm struck by the map of Philadelphia and the similarity of its gridiron, its microcosm to the to the design of 13th century English market towns with a horizontal center street called Market or High Street, which is what they would have called Market Street, High Street, and parallel back lanes often named South Street and North Street. Mm. Do you think Penn and Holm were using these towns as a model? Oh, this is very interesting. Thank you very much. And actually, um, uh, yeah, I mentioned the markets earlier and I didn't have time to, to, to insist on that, but market towns were actually not just the, the idea of market we can have today, but market towns were actually uh, specific um, privileged towns. Being able to hold a market uh, meant that you were able to well, have a commercial activity to make revenue, to gather people extra. So market towns were actually, well, um, regulated by very specific uh, laws. And um, I started to, to look at uh, engravings and well, paintings of, of market towns actually. But thank you very much, uh, Eric, for, for this, because I, uh, I didn't know about the configuration with the high street and uh, south street, etc. So yeah. thank you. This, this is a very interesting contribution. Thank you, Eric. William Jordan, uh, as again, as you're thinking ahead to your research, um, when when you do visit, uh, go to James Logan's property, Stenton. Have you been there yet? Nope. <laughs> special. I'll drop a link in chat, but then um, there is a related question from William asking, what led you to this topic? What led to this topic? Like what, uh, what, what captured your interest about this topic? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, well, oh yeah. Um, I work on contemporary politics too, so I uh, explain in them. And so I'm going to be a, a traitor to early American studies now. And I don't want to, um, well, sound presentist or anything. But actually, I did my research, uh, well, uh, on, well, contemporary 
the contemporary Tea Party movement. Well, I don't have time to uh, go into the details, but I followed uh, local activists on their, well, um, regular activism, um, on their organization and how they, I was notably interested in how they canvassed mm. for electoral purposes. Mm. And this is when one of them tried to explain me borough, township, county, and Philadelphia is a city and a county. And you have the Montgomery County, but there are counties in counties and township in counties. And I thought I needed to understand what was the administrative, political, electoral division of the US to understand. I needed to understand that. This is not the only reason, but um, it's a different uh, division um, than in, in, in France, for example. And um, trying to understand all these uh, different uh, units um, actually was important to understand also uh, all the, the, the questions revolving around local, local government, because this is also my main focus of research, local government. So if I don't understand how um, the territory um, is distributed today or back then, I cannot understand. Well, in this uh, map, in the 1690 map, you have the Welsh tract, the Welsh township, so you saw the Welsh township and the German township. Um, the Welsh actually, um, well, try to vote um, in Philadelphia, whereas they were not authorized back then. So they would cheat and try to, to cross the, the limit uh, to be able to vote um, in, in Philadelphia County. And Philadelphia County was also interesting because you could vote twice you had uh, to vote in the city election and in the county election. So to make a sense of all this mess, I had to understand how everything works. And of course, it takes you back to England because this is where Penn uh, took his, um, well, his model of, of, of distribution of territory. So thank you for this question. Yeah, well, and at some point, someone has to explain to me um, as a Philadelphia transplant, how the heck the ward system came to be and you know how it's organized because I find this very interesting coming here. So maybe that's um, a future talk, Agnes. We can talk about the, the space and the sort of uh, political economy around it. Yeah. Um, I wanna be cognizant of the time. I'm sorry, Fred, Eric, uh, Gerald, and um, sorry, Gerald, we missed two of your questions, but um, I suspect that we're gonna have some notes from this session that will be yeah. circulating. Um, Agnes has generously offered to compile some of her, her uh, readings, um, which I think will be very interesting. So we can continue the journey and hopefully we'll have her back when this is a book, um, <laughs> but certainly we can have her back for another work in progress as well. Uh, so thank you all for joining tonight and thank you especially Agnes uh, for sharing your research. Thank you very much Will and thank you for all your uh, very interesting and helpful questions. I'm very glad. Thank you to all. All right have a great night. I, excuse me have a great night everyone. <laughs>